I'm very happy to welcome all of you in our next session. My name is Markus Eberle and I'm happy to yeah, um, welcome all of you. So the topic of today is correlation between calculation and practice for simple top to bottom PCB heat dissipation using TIM and BIAS. I'm happy to welcome also Andreas, who is working as a field application engineer at Wirf Electronic. Very nice to do the webinar with you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, just a quick information from my side at the beginning. The webinar this morning um, will be about, or the presentation will be about 30 minutes long. And then after that, we have 10 to 15 minutes scheduled for your questions. You can just um, send us the questions with the Q&A function. You will find that with the WebEx function on the lower right hand side. And then, um, yeah, if we can't answer your questions in this live webinar now, we will answer them later on via email. So you will get your answers. And if you have any questions left after the webinar, just email us at digital minus v minus days at we minus online.com. The next days, you will also get the link to the presentation and as well to the recording of the session. And yeah, you will get Edwi any information. And now I'm finished. Um, I wish you a very exciting and interesting webinar. And Andreas, it's your go. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Marcus. You. You're welcome. All right. So, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Andreas Nadler. I am field application engineer in the south of Bavaria. So I hope all of you will understand my south Bavarian accent. I will do my very best to not to be the, the too hard R uh, in the pronouncement. Well, uh, today we will talk about thermal management uh, and why is it very important. In the end, we will have well, we have uh, nowadays an increase in efficiency in electronic, but on the same time we have an increase in power density. That means the thermal management is as important as it was uh, 20 years ago. So we need to take a lot of thoughts about how to get rid of the heat of our electronic components. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of simple calculations you can do in front of the development. And I will show you today how much correlation you will get in very simple applications like I will show you and how much deviation you will have. And uh, I will show you where the deviation will come from and to get or in, in the end to get a better overall feeling how accurate you can estimate such thermal management calculations. Well, for this presentation, I made a demo board. Um, uh, for this presentation, I use only the the lower, uh, let's say, SMT component here with the heatsink on the top side, the LDO on the bottom side, and sorry, and this will be uh, used to uh, produce heat in the end. So the LDO is just a, a power dissipation, the, my, my heat source, where I can easily adjust the power dissipation overall and with a simple adjustment of current and voltage, and therefore I can easily adjust for my need what. I will have and not have. So um, this is the schematic for it. The, as I said, we only use uh, the lower side, not the top side. The top is uh, a THD component in the, the same LDO in a TO220 package. This was made for another demonstration purpose. In the presentation today, I only used the lower SMT part, which is uh, soldered on the bottom side on the PCB and connected via uh, thermal wires to the top side and uh, thermal interface material in between. So this is how the components looks like. Uh, these are really pretty common LDOs with uh, different packages. So the IC inside is the same, but the thermal resistance from the packages are different. And as I said today, we only take a look on the D2 pack, which is mounted on the bottom side. So this is the 2D uh, view on the PCB from top. And we can see here, I have a copper polygon, a bigger one, and in the middle there are the thermal wires, the array 11 by 11 wires, which connect the bottom soldered LDO thermally to the top side. And we will use a thermal interface material with a, with which will have the same size like the 
copper polygon here and on top we will have the heatsink. So there are, a few, uh, let's say, a few information in the datasheet which is interesting for us. One of this can be maybe the uh, thermal resistance junction to ambient. This is interesting if you have no heatsink at all. So uh, this gives you the information how, uh, oh, how big is the temperature rise of the component if you uh, apply uh, the power. So you will have a temperature rise of around 50 or 62 Kelvin if you have one watt of power dissipation. So that means this component can uh, not really uh, used uh, in its real performance because even with one or two watt you will get to the limits of the components if you uh, add the ambient temperature additionally to it. So this is uh, the first view in this uh, session not interesting for us. For us it's interesting the junction to case terminal resistance. This is the terminal resistance from the bottom side of the T-pack, from the metal, from the soldered metal part to the PCB and it's much lower terminal resistance. That means you can apply much more higher power uh, and do not overheat the component so easily. Well, this is the stack up uh, from the side view. On the top we have our D2 pack, then we have the PCB FR4 material with the thermal wires, then we have our thermal interface material and at least we have our heatsink. And all of them have different thermal resistance and RTH is the name for it. And so we have a RTH for the junction to case, we already know. Then we need to calculate the RTH of the wire array. Then we need to know the RTH of the thermal interface material and at least the thermal, the thermal resistance of the heatsink itself. And then we can make, uh, let's say, a series uh, adding of all the different single temperatures and we get the overall temperature of the component in the end. If you take a look only on one wire alone, there are different possibilities. So in this presentation, I will show you just simple uh, standard wires because they are much more cheaper than uh, thermal wires, which are filled with solder or copper or anything else. This is something you can uh, negotiate with your uh, PCB supplier, but in the end, it's much more expensive than using standard wires, let's say. So we have here uh, inner diameter in this, in this ex example of 0.5 millimeter and a length of 1.6 millimeter, which is a pretty common standard uh, top to bottom via in many PCBs. And a single via in this con configuration will have a thermal resistance of 64 Kelvin per watt, which is at first glance pretty high. Okay? Therefore, we will make uh, some kind of an array. We will uh, connect many vias in parallel to get down the thermal resistance of the overall VR array. This is how it looks like. So I'm choose, oh, I chose the size of the VR array uh, correlating to the size of the DPEG because if the VR array from the size is bigger than the DPEG, the effect is pretty low then in the end. So you can only get the really uh, pull out the heat of the components directly under the component. So if you make a VR array which is, is as big as the whole, let's say, copper polygon on top, this will have no real uh, positive effect. So this is only the not drawback, you have no space anymore for uh, routing and uh, PCB itself, the mechanical stability maybe is decreased, something like this. And therefore I choose 11 by 11 uh, VR array, which has the size around 10 millimeter square. This is then perfectly fitting to the component on the bottom side. So at first glance, uh, or at, at the first step, we need to calculate the thermal conductivity of this VR array. Therefore, we need to know the thermal conductivity of copper. This is given. Then we need uh, the distance from VR to VR, the size of the inner tube of the VR, the copper plating of the, the tube inside the VR, and the pitch of the VRs. And then we can calculate the overall thermal conductivity of this field. In our example here, we got a uh, thermal conductivity of our field where I only used uh, 0603 wires, 11 by 11, so we have 121 wires in total. And this gives us, in this, uh, in this example, a thermal conductivity of 9, of 9 watt meter by Kelvin. So, and with this thermal conductivity, we can now calculate the thermal resistance. This is done uh, we need to know the thickness of the PCB. So this is then in the end the length of the vias. This is 1.6 millimeter. 
and we need to uh, know the, the area, the size of the array. And this, uh, in combination with the thermal, re uh, thermal conductivity, gives us the overall result, uh, and this is 1.5 Kelvin per watt in our calculation. So that means uh, one watt of power dissipation will uh, produce 1.5 Celsius or 1.5 uh, Kelvin of heat in this area. So in our ex example, we used 11 by 11 because it fits pretty good from the overall size. And you can see here in this table, um, if we start at only 3 by 3, we get only uh, half of the thermal, uh, uh, let's say, thermal conductivity or we had the double the thermal resistance. And the more we increase the size of the, uh, the amount of wires, we get a much better thermal uh, resistance. But there is some kind of asymptotic behavior. That means even if you now put uh, 20 by 20, you will not have 99% of reduction of the thermal resistance, it's maybe then 92. So there's a, a certain point where more and more wires, uh, depending on the size of the component, makes no sense anymore. All right, if we use a um, PCB without thermal wires, so that means we only use the FR4 material to conduct the heat from the bottom side to the top side, we would have a thermal resistance of 53 Kelvin per watt. So that means it's uh, yeah, around 40 times or 45 times higher than without wires. So you can see standard wires cost no money anymore and it will dramatically increase the thermal performance of your system in this example here. Well, we know uh, the second we, we did the second step. That means we have the terminal resistance junction to case. We have then now the terminal resistance of the wires, and now we have to or we need to calculate the terminal resistance of the terminal interface material, which is also sold by Virtual Electronic. And this uh, example, I used the so-called TGF. It's a 0.5 millimeter thick uh, terminal interface material with a terminal conductivity of six. Six, kel meet, uh, six watt meter by Kelvin. So um, to calculate the resulting thermal resistance, we need to know the thickness, we need to know the thermal conductivity, and we need to know the, uh, the surface area which is uh, effectively used. And with these three values, we know uh, the overall result uh, of the thermal resistance, which is in this case only 0.052 Kelvin per watt. So we can see the influence of the thermal interface material is pretty low compared to the other thermal resistance in this application. So the last uh, step we need to do is to calculate the thermal resistance or to read out the thermal resistance of our heatsink. The data sheets are not always the same. You will have different graphs from different suppliers. In this case, uh, I used the simple standard 40 by 40 by 20 millimeter uh, IC heatsink, uh, which is used in, for example, FPGA applications or whatever. So, and you will have at zero airflow, uh, so natural convection, uh, thermal resistance of around 3.5 Kelvin per watt. So then we have all uh, values we need in our chain. Now we can calculate the resulting temperature of our component. And we start with the ambient temperature then we need we take the, te the thermal resistance of the heatsink, we multiply this with our power dissipation. In my uh, example here, I used mostly 3.3 watt power dissipation. This, we made a multiplication, then we, and we uh, add, the add the ambient temperature and we get a temperature at this point of 38 degrees. On well, the next point, as we have a pretty low thermal resistance of the thermal interface material, we only have 9, 39 degrees. Then the wires gives us uh, additionally 5 degrees more with the, when we multiply this with our power dissipation. And at least we take the RT, uh, RTG, RTGC, so the junction to case. Uh, thermal resistance and we get a um, calculated temperature of the component in our application here of 54 degrees. So we need to remember this value for the next steps in the end. But first I, I would like to show you the influence of the thickness and the uh, thermal conductivity of the overall temperature in our uh, experiment here. 
So here on the left side, we can see I made the same calculations with a TGF, um, with the, this is in the end the used TGF in our first example. We got, uh, for example, in application then 49 degrees. If you use a TGF um, with the same thickness, but much lower thermal conductivity, that means this is a much more cheaper product in the end. This has only one watt meter by Kelvin, this has six watt meter by Kelvin, but the overall influence of the temperature is pretty low. So that means you do not always need a pretty expensive thermal interface material um, in applications where your heatsink is not pretty good. So a good heatsink has a thermal resistance of a, uh, under one uh, Kelvin per watt. So in our example we have 3.5 Kelvin per watt and then the influence of a pretty expensive thermal interface material is pretty low. So you can save here a lot of money in the end because it has only maybe one degree of influence. A big influence has the thickness. If I use the same TGF with one watt meter by Kelvin, but with a uh, five millimeter thickness, then we got a much more higher thermal resistance at this uh, stage. And then the temperature rise around nine degrees. So this has a much more bigger influence on your system than the thermal conductivity in our, in this application. Uh, in applications with very good heatsink, it's a different story. So always try to stay uh, pretty thin with the, let's say, the, con the, 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 the contact area between the heat source and the thermal interface material. And this is the measurement setup. I used a, a FLIR camera on the top. So here on top on, on the glass cube is a FLIR camera, a pretty expensive one. We have a glass cube around the PCB, so we have no airflow here. And for validation, I used a fluke thermocouple element where I try to connect on the possible hottest point just to get uh, a second information if my measurement with the thermo camera is correct. And I also used a chalk spray. This is the white uh, area you can see on the PCB. So we have a homogeneous ER radiation pattern. That means I have no glossy surface anymore and I have a really good uh, measurement result with the FLIR ER camera, IR camera. And this <coughs> is the measurement result in the end. Um, we can see ambient temperature was 26, so it was in summertime. You can see in the lab was, was pretty warm. Um, we had, we measured, uh, or I measured a maximum temperature with the camera of around 74 degrees, 73, 74. The fluke showed me around 72, so it was not far away. Uh, but the calculated temperature was only 54. So we got a rough uh, deviation between the calculation and the measurement of around 20 degrees. And the question is, hmm, why? Well, where did I make the mistakes or what the, did I miss here in my calculation? Well, in the first measurement, um, so this one, I only used uh, cable stripes to strap the heatsink to the PCB. So there, I used no screws there, just a little bit force with the cable stripes and some holes in the PCB. And this was one of the first mistakes. So that means if I now use the four screws here and screw the heatsink with a, with a say, dedicated uh, force to the PDB and a homogeneous force, then I get only 17 degrees of difference, not 20 anymore. So I, I'm getting better, three degrees, only because I used no hex cable stripes, but I used the screws. But even with this, the difference is pretty big. So now I tried to uh, variate the thermal interface material between. Before I used the so our so-called TGF. This is a silicon standard material, pretty soft uh, on a ceramic based. And now I use a phase change material. That means a material that is, um, let's say, hard under 50 degrees. And from 50 to 60 degrees, the uh, phase change happens inside the material, and then it's getting um, some kind of uh, getting some kind of waxy. So it's uh, a mixture between a thermal grease and uh, a normal material. Let's say it has the advantages. You can um, fabricate this or install this pretty easy with no big uh, mess. Let's say it compared to a thermal grease. Uh, and on, if the temperature is rising over 50 degrees on, or over 60 degrees, so this is the tolerance here, 60 degrees is the worst case, then the material is getting waxy a little bit. And to make sure I have the full phase change, I increase the power dissipation from 3.3 to 5 watt now. 
And the calculated temperature uh, in, the, in the pure mathematic way is now 66 degrees, not 54 anymore. And I measured 92, but also only with cable stripes at the moment. So the difference was pretty big, uh, still pre pretty big, so around 26 degrees. And this was the result if I, when I opened again the connection between the PCB and the heatsink. And you can see without the screws used, only the cable stripes for pressuring the heatsink to the PCB, we get no really good connection. We only had a little bit connection in the middle in this area here on the bottom right side, where we can get rid uh, of the heat of the thermal uh, of the VR array. So this was in the end a yeah, pretty bad result. And we can only make it better if we now connect this with the screws and put a defined force on it. And this is uh, what I have done. So uh, the calculated temperature, as I said, was 66. And now with the screwed heatsink, I'm only getting 11 degrees. So uh, better 15 degrees compared to the cable strapped version. And I'm much closer now to the calculated. I'm only, let's say, uh, 11 degrees away anymore. And this is how it looks like if we open this again after uh, we screwed it. So you can see we have now a pretty nice homogeneous uh, coverage of the phase change material. And this is then a pretty good, let's say, chance to get rid of the heat of the component. And I also compared this with a thermal paste, so a classical thermal grease. It has the same thermal conductivity like the phase change material. So it is around 6.5 watt meter by Kelvin. And the resulting temperature was 61. So pretty much the same like the phase change material. So we can say in this application, they are both as good as each other. And, but with the phase change material, you have much less, let's say, uh, headache uh, during the installation phase. And the, one of the biggest advantage of the phase change material is the aging. The thermal paste can age and can drying out. So, uh, the semiconductor moves uh, in hard switch applications uh, a, a few nanometers, micrometers, and this will pump out the silicon parts of the thermal paste, and this will lead in the end to uh, drying out of the thermal paste and the thermal resistance in the system getting worse and worse every, let's say, week and year. This is not happening with a phase change material so easily. Okay, why do we have the deviation? What uh, points did I do not take into account? Okay, first, uh, I do not take into account the, the holes here in the horizontal copper plane. To the copper plane is the, is the purpose of the copper plane is to spread the heat from the middle to the edges where we can connect the same size of heatsink. The heatsink was a little bit bigger than the copper plane. This could also be an issue. And we do not take into account any solder paste thermal resistance in our calculation. So let's go on. The solder paste we got between the bottom side and the top side a little bit. So we need to know if there is a really an influence on our thermal, let's say, behavior with the, uh, with the solder paste. And in the end, what we, what, what we are missing is we are missing 3.5 Kelvin per watt because our deviation is still around 12 Kelvin uh, from the calculation to the measurement. And we are missing, therefore, if we multiply this with the, or we d divide this through the power dissipation, we get, to, we know we're missing around 3.5 Kelvin per watt thermal resistance in our calculation. So there are different kinds of solder pastes on the market. I try to use uh, one which is pretty much in the middle of the thermal conductivity. But in the end, you can see the resulting thermal resistance is only 0.03 Kelvin per watt. So that means the, the solder paste in our application here has really no influence. So we can skip this out as our, from our thoughts. So this is not the, yeah, the, the big impact here. Another big impact can be maybe a mismatch in the calculation of the thermal wire array. So therefore I, uh, therefore, I try to measure the thermal uh, or the, the temperature difference between the bottom side and the top side. And the measurement shows me I have a temperature difference between both sides of around 2.5 degrees. So this is then with one watt of power dissipation, I get 2.5 Kelvin per watt. 
and I calculate at 1.5. So, okay, we have a deviation, but in the problem here with this measurement is I have no real heat pipe effect because I have no heat sink in this measurement with the two thermal couples on both sides. And therefore, with, a, with no heat sink, the result is not pretty much accurate because the thermal wire is only working proper if you have some kind of heat sink effect of a, a heat sink on the secondary side to pull away the heat. So, but we are not that far away, let's say. But we cannot be sure here. But I found out the biggest issue is the horizontal or the lateral thermal resistance of the copper plane. So the copper plane has a thickness, a standard thickness of uh, 35 micrometer, which is standard in the electronic business. You can uh, spend a little bit more money and you can use then 70 micrometers, which gives you a lower thermal resistance, of course. But we can see from the middle to the edges, we get a difference of temperature of 18 Kelvin. That means we do not have a very perfect connection to the heatsink. So the heatsink is only connected pretty good at the middle, but the edges are not really good connected to the heatsink from a thermal aspect. So that means we lose a lot of uh, term, or we have a lot of thermal resistance from the middle to the edges. And this is pretty mm, nasty to calculate, let's say. Uh, it's not that easy, but you need to know there is an effect. And to prove this, I cut out most of the copper plane here and used a smaller heatsink, which is a little bit equally, more equally the size of the thermal wire array. So the wire array is 11 by 11 millimeter and the heatsink is 14 by 14. And then I try to uh, find out if the influence here is much smaller or let's say the calculation relates better to the measurement. And yes, it do. If I calculate this example, I will get a uh, calculated temperature of the LDO of uh, 61 degree around and the measured was 61 and the, uh, with the, the heatsink and the measured one on the LDO was also 61. That means we can see here the thermal wires uh, on between these two measurements uh, is around 1.3 Kelvin per watt. So this fits perfectly to our measurement, uh, to our calculation. And the overall calculation fits also pretty good. So that means the biggest influence in the whole system or the biggest deviation we had in our calculation was the lateral thermal resistance of the copper plane here. All right. <coughs> so makes, uh, at, at, le at last we make two, voice, uh, two let's say slides for the conclusion. So what is critical? The, the thermal interface contact pressure is critical. You saw it uh, if you compare the screwed one with the cable striped one. So always make sure we have some constant force. So you uh, only can have some constant gap or some constant force. And constant force uh, you will only get if you maybe take some uh, feathers in between the screw and the PCB where we have over let's say different temperature and different lifetime, uh, the same contact pressure which is applied through the filler. So this is a good recommendation to make a, a constant pressure application. Uh, the copper plane area in our application here has a big influence uh, related to the wire array, but it gives you no better result if you make the wire array much bigger because the component is pretty small and therefore you can, uh, you can only pull heat outside the component uh, directly underneath it pretty good. Uh, the holes and cutouts should be minimized, of course, and the thickness of the copper can be uh, thicker. So instead of 35, use 70 micrometer. The VRRTA was pretty close to reality. So the last measurement showed me we calculated 1.5 Kelvin per watt and the reality shows me around 1.3 Kelvin per watt of the wire array. So this fits pretty, pretty good. And Okay, the wire array only works pretty, pretty good if you have directly underneath it a heatsink or a case where you can connect it, uh, housing on the other side. Otherwise, you do not have this, uh, let's say, heat pipe effect, which, you, uh, which really helps you in the application. And the conclusion, um, the better the performance of the heatsink, of course, the better or the more important the thermal conductivity of the thermal interface material. So it makes no sense to buy a pretty expensive thermal interface material and combine this with a pretty low performance uh, heatsink in the end. The thickness is much more critical than the thermal conductivity in many applications. So try to minimize the thickness between the heatsink and the PCB or the component. 
And of course, the, the surface has a big influence on the overall thermal performance. So uh, try to use soft material, try to use a phase change material, uh, and then you will get the best result. And if you have the, the let's say, the, 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 if you can choose between many big or a few big wires and many small wires, always choose many small wires to conduct the heat. This gives you a better result. And of course, stay to try to stay to standard wires like I did here. Um, it's much more expensive. Uh, only if you really have a high performance application where you really need as low as thermal resistance as possible, use the plated or filled so-called thermal wires, the real thermal wires. This was all from my side. Thank you very much for uh, your time. And I'm looking forward to your questions. So, thank you, Andri, for Welcome. this great uh, presentation. And yeah, as you already said, now we are here for your questions. So we have some time to go through them. And we see there are already a lot of different questions coming in. Just a hint, if we can't answer them now in the live webinar, we will answer them later on by email. And also, if you have any questions left, you see the email addresses at the moment on the slide and just email us. Okay. Yeah, let's so, start with the first session, uh, with the first, first question, let's say. The question is, can you customize the thermal interface materials? Yes, we can customize every of our materials, uh, theoretically from, uh, uh, let's say, a part count one to infinite. So yes, we can customize this. Um, Perfect. Is there an optimal wire size that mm -hmm. minimizes the thermal resistance? Um, as far as I know, not. Uh, as I said, if you have, uh, you usually always have a certain space or certain uh, area which you uh, would like to use your uh, thermal wires. And for in my uh, for example, you have a 10 by 10 millimeter, like in my application, try to use uh, many small wires, but stay also or stick to standard sizes. So go not below uh, a certain size of wires. So let's say go not below 05, 02. So 05 outer diameter, 02 inner diameter drilling. So that means I used 06, 03, for example. 08, 04 would also be fine and so on, but try to, uh, to put as many wires in the small area as possible and uh, try to make the pitch of the wire, so the, the distance from wire to wire as small as possible. Okay, so I see also here a very long question. Maybe we would do it at the end or also by email. Um, so then we would go on with the next question. Um, yeah, and you can just uh, pick or uh, yeah, we could go with that one. Um, how uh, yeah. That's a good question. How can perfect soldering be guaranteed if the wires are not filled and covered or kept? So yeah, it's always an issue because the wires always suck away your uh, solder. Therefore, you maybe you need a little bit really uh, experiment in your with the the thickness of your uh, stencil in this case. So. I cannot give you a real 100% uh, true, let's say, um, recommendation here because it's depending on the kind of solder, the kind of area, the kind of components, the kind of uh, pad size. Uh, in the end, if you would like to make sure, you can uh, make stencils with uh, different thicknesses and maybe in this area you can use a stencil with a little bit higher th uh, thickness and therefore you get more materi uh, solder material into it. But there is no real, from my side, maybe a good manufacturer can give you this recommendation from our partner with Electronic CBT. Maybe can give you a better answer if there are some uh, knowledge from the past from other customers, how much stencil thickness or how much solder you should use here. Okay, um, then we would go with the next question. So yeah. how much should the tin be compressed between PCB and heatsink? Yeah. We give you a recommendation of around 10% to 30%. That means uh, a compression rate of 20-30% gives you a good result because there's also some kind of asymptotic behavior. Uh, if you give a very low pressure, of course, the thermal resistance is significantly higher. But if you go over 30% of pressure, usually the, in in uh, the decrease of thermal resistance is pretty, pretty low compared to the stress for the material. So 30% for the most of our 
thermal uh, resist uh, thermal interface materials is a good way. Okay, so I see here often the question regarding the presentation. So mm -hmm. yeah, you will get later on the link from us to the presentation as well with the uh, recording, the link to the recording. So we will send you an email in the next days. And also you will find that information all on our homepage. We will upload all the different um, sessions from our digital V days uh, on our homepage. So yeah, but keep to the topic. Um, yeah, next question. Andreas, is it better to use THT wires or a U-wire buried wire combination? Okay, so uh, I can give you a clear uh, recommendation here. Try to stay to standard. So a buried wire, in my point of view, gives you no real advantage. Uh, only if you really have no space and you need to use the buried wires to spread the heat internally in the PCB. So that means if you have internally a ground layer, a ground plane in the PCB and you would like to transfer the heat from one uh, side of the PCB to the inner layer, then maybe a buried wire makes sense if you have no space on the other side on the PCB because it's high density design, then it makes sense. But in most, let's say, most standard applications, it makes no sense. Just try to stay, uh, make the PCB as uh, thin as possible. This will help you. So if you have not uh, the need for a 1.6 millimeter, maybe go down for one millimeter. This can be helpful in terms of EMC and can it be helpful in terms of thermal conductivity in the end. Okay, so thank you very much for the question, uh, for the answer, also okay. for the question. <laughs> so then um, we will just have a quick look um, at the next questions. Um, what what costs more? This can be. Can yeah. Be so <laughs> the next question is: What cost? What costs more? Uh, One thousand wires with a standard thickness of twenty-five uh, micrometers, or five hundred wires with thirty-five um, micrometers, okay. or seventy micrometers wire thickness. Yeah. In the end, uh, I think the problem is uh, you cannot uh, tell the. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I can, you cannot tell the PCB manufacturer only do, uh, that he only should change the wires to 70 micrometer and maybe not the rest of the, the copper. So, uh, and this is also very different from supplier to supplier in the end. So, but to be honest, uh, a wire itself costs no money anymore nowadays. So you do not have to pay for amount of wires like in the recent years for many years ago. So this question, maybe you have to take an overall look on it. If the overall performance of the PCB uh, with a 70 micrometer copper uh, is cheaper, because if you maybe then can use a smaller and cheaper heatsink or a smaller or a cheaper housing, you don't need maybe no metal housing anymore. Maybe you can stay to a cheaper plastic housing. So it's an overall cost uh, point of view. It's difficult to say 1,000 year costs less than 500 with a bigger thickness. I cannot really answer this. Uh, maybe a, a PCB manufacturer can really answer this, but in my point of view, you should, you should do an overall cost uh, re review of your design because it, uh, everything influences everything in the end. And if you can get smaller and cheaper heatsink, you can reduce the size, take another housing material, then it has a much more bigger influence than the amount and thickness of wires, I guess. Okay, Andreas, thank you very much. Then we have some time left for our last questions. We will try it with the long version. Um, maybe it's possible because yeah, there are some questions in that. Um, so yeah. What is the best approach to det determine an ambient temperature? How we should treat calculations and deratings if our environment temperature is really close to allowable ambient temperature by maximum determined by IC manufacturer? Maybe we could start with that, um, or shall I? Ah, I will go on. Go if on. we calculate maximum junction temperature and if you, our calculations show that we are reaching, for example, 80% of maximum allowed junction temperature, do you think that our application is safe to use? Well, uh, from a lifetime point of view, the most of the semiconductor guys will tell you, yeah, try to stay below 80 degrees of the material because 
every 10 degrees more will uh, shorten your lifetime by, by 50% in the end. So it's always a good uh, choice to stay below 80 degrees. In your application, it seems not to be possible. Um, the problem here is uh, if you say you stay around 80% 80, 80 of the maximum temperature of your IC, then I would recommend you to make only worst case calculations. So you need to know the tolerance really of the PCB, the tolerance of the thermal interface material, the thermal, uh, the tolerance of the heatsink, the tolerance of the aging of the thermal interface material, and so on. So then you can do this calculation. It's uh, it's maybe a little bit more, it takes you more effort and you need to put simply more headroom into it. Yeah, I know some applications like oil drilling uh, where you have ambient temperatures of 150 to 200 degrees and more. Then you simply need to, or you have to make sure, or you, yeah, you have to be aware that your lifetime of the semiconductor will be shortened dramatically. And not only the passive components, even the semiconductor will sh shorten dramatically in its lifetime. And of course, uh, the, the worst case calculation must be done more rough, uh, yeah, for all. Durchdacht, was heißt durchdacht nochmal? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm also <laughs> not the native speaker, so. I, yeah, I'm not an English word, but, <laughs> but I have to, have, have to spend more time in, yeah, in the yeah. calculation there and maybe more testing time. It's possible, yes, but I. I it's not, I would not recommend it, but of course, if you have no other choice, then make a worst case. Always take the, from every IC, from every passive component, you have to take the worst, ta worst case tolerances and have to calculate with this. And the aging of every component, the passives and the, the active one has also different uh, aging processes, let's say, you have to take it into account because if then you have a semiconductor, usually you have also have some capacitor and some inductor, and especially the capacitor has different aging properties. So uh, MLCC is aging 10% uh, per dec or 2% per decade, if I have it or correct in mind. And uh, electrolyte capacitor and polymer has a completely different behavior. So we have really taken into account all the components then. Okay. Andreas, thank you very much for all You're the welcome. answers. And as well for your time today and the presentation. It was a pleasure. For me as well. So yeah. thank you for all your attention. If there are some questions open now, we will answer them later on via email. And yeah, if you have some questions left, just email us. So I hope you stay tuned on our digital we days. There are some sessions coming up for also today. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.